Evan Eshelman, um, who uh, has some uh, wolfing experience um, overseas, and Troy Hall, and I got that right, correct? Right? And Bill, it's really white, but we call him Bill Badger. So, <laughs> so there you go. So quick introduction, and, um, and then we'll, after that, go through about what your thoughts about the movie were. Hello, I'm Michael Fairbrother. I'm the uh, owner and founder of Moonlight Meadery. My background in beekeeping, I had a beehive when I was uh, 12 years old. I gave up beekeeping around when I was 20, but really do appreciate honey, and I thought the movie was great. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Evan Eshelman, and I don't really have a background in beekeeping, but uh, I'm here because last summer um, I spent some time working on a small organic farm in France uh, doing beekeeping. Um, and so while I don't have a lot of experience that these guys have, I can talk a little bit about what that was like and what the French family's perspective is on, on beekeeping and some of the problems that they face. My name is Troy Hall, and uh, I'm the president of the Kearsarge Beekeepers Association. And I'm also a part-time beekeeper. I manage 100 colonies of the playing field in Hampshire. And uh, Mike, I've been keep, uh, keeping bees for about seven years now. Only in the last uh, four or five years I've been doing it more of a part-time. Uh, I'm looking at doing it more of a full-time as, as uh, I expand the number of colonies and, and grow the business that way. But, uh, yeah, that's... A little bit about me. Okay. Turn it off or I'm Bill White. I was a carpenter for about 20 years, and I kept bees 20 years ago. And then when the bear got him, I stopped. Uh, I started Badger 16 years ago, and we used beeswax in our products. And when I read about colony collapse disorder, I started visiting beekeepers, learning about beekeeping, keeping bees, and coming up with some ideas and thoughts about how to do a better job of it. So that's my background. Great. If you'll hold on to the mic and from that direction coming forward, what did you think about the movie? Um, I, thought, I thought it was charming. It was kind of interesting. Um, I think heart. I think heart is the answer, and I think that's what they were trying to depict. Right. Um, I'm still kind of, I was thinking about the whole movie, what am I, what, 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 am, what, what, uh, I guess the first thing I got was I'm really, it makes me, uh, I'm really glad that I'm a beekeeper. <laughs> I can identify with uh, a lot of, uh, a lot of the, I guess the relationship that exists between a beekeeper and the bees that you, were, you know, you, you, you keep, or you, you don't really keep them, but they keep you, I think, um, as a beekeeper. Um, yeah, it was just a beautiful movie, especially the scene where uh, the French beekeeper is, is, uh, is holding the bee, you know, he has no shirt on. He has no veil. Um, I think that's it, it's something. You know, I work bees the same way in a way, but it's it. I just the fact that I can identify with that made it uh, a movie that uh, um, is worth seeing in my opinion. Obviously, the message that it portrays too is very important. I feel. Um, I think I really like the line. It was kind of towards the beginning uh, that you know everyone should care about beekeeping. And, um, I mean, you could extend that to say that, like, even, you know, even non-beekeepers should care about beekeeping. Um, I think the movie did a pretty good job uh, really explaining how bee civilization isn't just, like, a simple cookie-cutter thing that you can fit into, like, a, you know, a kind of a large-scale agriculture system like we have in the U.S., and that... Yeah, I think it's really important to appreciate how like multifaceted and complex uh, like these society really is. So, uh, I, I thought the movie was well done. I think they presented the story um, as best they could with what they had. Um, I think they could have touched a little bit more on bee diversity. I know the Italian honeybees have been predominantly used in this country for decades, but the some of the beekeepers I know have been bringing in bees from Russia and have much better success with it. But I think they missed up on that. I was very happy they mentioned me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, I'd like to ask each one of you, uh, what are you experiencing about bee colony collapse in, in your own bee world? And that includes your French one, uh, Evan. So, um, 
how far is it going and, and what is being done about it and your thoughts on it and, and experience, please. Well, like I said, um, we, we're consumer of hunting. We consume it quite a bit. And um, we've seen an increase in price, but we have heard from a lot of the beekeepers that I used to buy honey from, I'm um, trying to stay close to New Hampshire, um, that they've introduced different colony uh, types of bees and they're having better success with them. Um, well, I was in France last summer, and the summer before I was there, um, the family, it, uh, it was really, it's a really small kind of farm that they run, it's just a husband and wife have about 200 um, colonies or hives, uh, which is pretty typical for France. Um, and th they're trying to make a living based off that number. And the year before I was there, they lost 50% of their hives. Um, and I asked them about colony collapse, uh, which is a little difficult because I don't speak French and they don't speak English. But, uh, <laughs> their kind of attitude is that they weren't really going to attribute it to colony collapse, but they do have a lot of problems with the mites um, that they showed a little bit in the video, the uh, barrow, barrow destructors, is that it? Yeah. Um, and because they're kind of an organic operation, they w wouldn't really use pesticides to deal with that. So uh, the way they're dealing with that is by using uh, essence of thyme, which is a little more of an organic solution. Um, and from what I gather, the way it works is you put these strips of almost paper that have been dipped in essence of time into the hives and it kind of drives the mites away. It doesn't kill them, it drives them away. Um, and so they're, by doing that, they're kind of able to deal with the mite situation. Um, their bees, I mean, they don't use pesticides, so they're not dealing with that aspect of what could be a possible cause of colony collapse. So their biggest struggle was dealing with, uh, dealing with the mites and things like that. Uh, my, my, what's my, what am I seeing in my, the question is... Yeah, you're co are you seeing a colony collapse and is there a problem in the Kearsage area? Uh, I can only speak for myself. Um, I have not seen any colony collapse-like symptoms. Uh, and I think a lot of people get confused with, um, especially since there's a lot of new people getting involved in beekeeping. Um, uh, I would, I, the way I see it, and the way, you know, if you talk to anybody who's kept bees for, you know, since the, since before our mites were introduced in the United States, prior to the, what, the early 80s, bees, even back in, you know, the 1800s, if you, if, are you guys, any, are you guys familiar with Brother Adams? He's a famous beekeeper. I mean, you look at any of the records, I mean, Brother Adams was famous for you know, developing the buck bash strain of honeybee, and he's, you know, there's a lot of beekeepers like him, like Kirk, uh, Kirk Webster was one beekeeper that was in the video. Um, invests a lot of time in breeding uh, a, a lines of bees that are that are uh, uh, can, that can I guess survive well enough on their own uh, without uh, in, in incorporating any sort of um, miticide or chemicals to help the bees survive. I guess to get the question out, the uh, I have not seen uh, myself. I, like I, what I was trying to get, I guess, is bees die all the time. Why they die is is like you know. Coming to a hive, uh, you know, in the springtime or in the winter, and seeing that there's plenty of food, there's there's no bees. Um, uh, I'm really, I'm not really quick to say that's colony collapse. I'm really, I think in order, you know, if you're going to really say it's colony collapse, you got to get, you know, you got to take samples, you got to get it tested. Um, you have to have somebody come in, uh, preferably a bee inspector from, you know, who knows what they're looking at, and and, di and then you can diagnose the the cause of the colony, why, you know, why the bees did survive the winter. Um, I think the you know an acceptable winter loss for me is, is 20 15 to 20 percent winter loss you know if I and one I don't I'm, I hope I don't lose you guys here the, the overwintering nucleus colonies is definitely in, in my perspective has saved my butt time and time again I don't I, I look I, I, I model the apiary that I have you know been trying to grow after uh, beekeepers such as Mike Palmer or Kirk Webster that live up in you know the Champlain Valley area Vermont um, and I can take winter losses, and at the same time, uh, my, the nucleus colonies that survived the winter, uh, I can replace winter losses with those bees. So I'm not purchasing bees, um, you know, packaged bees from the south. Um, the trick is to be able to get to the point where you can, I can propagate enough nucleus colonies, or other beekeepers that are interested in overwintering nukes can uh, also sell those nukes for sale to beekeepers in the, in the area. So you have a local stock of bee that's available to replenish winter losses with. 
Um, so anyways, I mean, there's, there's, I feel there's a lot of different reasons um, why bees die. I haven't, I know talking with other beekeepers in the area, I, I, I don't believe that there's been a huge epidemic of colony collapse disorder in this, in the New England area, at least where I'm at. There's, there's plenty of diversity and with, with forage and you know, obviously there's a lot of little local farms, so uh, we, we're not quite in the same position as the other guy. Good news. Bill, you need a lot of beeswax, so I'm sure you might have a different perspective. Uh, well, we end up getting organic beeswax from Australia or Canada because you can't get that amount of it in the States. But colony collapse di disorder, my understanding of it is, it's, it's weird, like bees die and usually you've got dead bees in your hive. Colony collapse disorder is somebody goes out, a lot of bees comes out the next week and most of the bees are gone. And most of the colony collapse disorder is confined to those large commercial apiaries. And you could see in the film, Imagine somebody uh, picked your house up, put it on a truck, uh, trucked you around the country, fed you, you know, uh, fructose, high fructose corn syrup, and put you in a monoculture so you, all you could eat was uh, almonds or something like that. And you would probably, as soon as you could escape, escape and not come back. <laughs> occurred to me is that we're not alone in this. It's very difficult, let's say, to have an organic garden in your backyard if uh, there's pollution from the air or from neighbors or runoff or whatever. So it's a, it's a community problem. It's a humanity problem. Uh, you can get USDA organic honey, with, you know, uh, which would mean it met those regulations. It might be something like within a two-mile radius of your apiary, you can document that there's nobody using pesticides, but bees, you know, aren't going to stop at the two-mile barrier. But your best bet's by organic honey, what I, I would think, or from a local beekeeper that's in a pretty good environment where there's not a lot of crop spraying going on. Troy, did you want to? Uh, my personal opinion, if you, live in New, if you live in the United States of America and you're buying local honey, uh, you cannot... I mean, unless you live, like, for example, at the White Mountains, where you have no neighbors for miles on end, if you look at where you're purchasing a lot of organic honey, it's coming from Argentina, it's coming from the rain, you know, places where there's, you know, hardly any uh, like small villages, you know, where people, like, there's plenty of forage and there's, you know, not a lot of, uh, you know, towns or cities, any, any, you know, any contamination of the honey. But if you, I always tell people, if you're buying honey, uh, the way I, I market my honey, I can't become USDA certified because I, my apiaries are located on organic. Some of them on organic farms, but just because it's on an organic farm doesn't mean, you know, neighbors are spraying or dandelions or it's nearly impossible for a beekeeper in the United States to uh, become or certify their honey or, or USDA organic unless you live, you know, in some barren part of this country where there's hardly anybody around or any any uh, you know, any crops to speak of. Um. Where I was in France, uh, the way they did it, um, they have a couple kinds of honey. Uh, they have mountain honey, which they have the hives just kind of on in the mountains, um, and the bees just go pollinate from the, the wildflowers. But they also have lavender honey, um, where they put the hives next to these giant lavender fields, and I mean those lavender fields are treated with pesticides, and uh, or they're sprayed in France, so. The honey that comes from there has to be uh, the farm I was at. They have to have someone come in and test it pretty extensively to, to make sure there's not above a certain threshold of pesticide level for it still to be considered organic. Just keep in mind, we can fly about six miles. So you know, to get a certified organic honey, you've got to have a pretty wide area for the bee to, to be able to, to roam, roam around with. Um, even to move a hive, you saw how they were moving the hives on the truck. I wanted to move a hive from that side of the yard to this side. You gotta move it six miles away and move it back. Otherwise they'll go right back to where they were. 
Honey, and what's the advantage of it? Or I know there's a great disadvantage to it, but what do you think about that? I'll speak quickly because I'm pretty sure there's other people. Uh, yep. Marketing, uh, oftentimes, if you're if packed like honey, people that are buying bulk honey on the on the open market will often, you know, if you're shelf life, a lot of people buy honey and they want it to be in a liquid state. So if you pasteurize honey, if you heat it above 150, 58 degrees, uh, you keep it in a liquid state longer. Um, it'll stay in a liquid state longer, whereas if you, uh, you know, if you don't um, pasteurize honey, if it's just a raw honey, or not raw, but if it's unheated, it'll, it'll granulate faster depending on what the percentage of fructose is in the, in, the, in the honey. Actually, we don't heat our honey, we heat our honey only up to 110 degrees so that we can actually pour it a little easier. But that when you heat honey up, you age honey, the flavor goes right out of it very fast. So if we were to heat our honey, our knees would taste horrible. So we get our honey as raw as we can, and we just heat it up just to 110 degrees, period, and for as little time as possible to get it so that we can mix it up with the water to make our wine. Anybody want to add or? No? Okay. Next. Yes. Um, what kind of hives do you have? The traditional hive or the top bar? Anybody? Okay. Uh, I have top bar hives. Uh, I keep lying straw hives, the traditional lying straw hives. Uh, the farm I was on was also using uh, lying straw hives. I got mine from Sears and Robux. Is there When you walk out in the city of Exeter when the Sears and Robux was there, and you walk out with a two and a half pound box of bees and you heard what the bees sound like, the crowd just goes. <laughs> <laughs> Time and time again, ever, uh, overwintering nucleus colonies. Uh, production colonies, I always see a higher percentage of winter loss or mite related deaths uh, in, the, in, the, in, in my stronger production colonies. And what I mean by a production colony is just the fact that it's a fully established colony where the population of bees will can you know, range from 60 to 80,000 bees, where a nucleus colony is derived of essentially that. It's a nucleus of a, of a stronger colony. So uh, I, I I, I can not, I, I don't have to treat my bees anymore because of the fact that I can you know, I can overwinter nucleus colonies and also like uh, in the last I've been breeding my own queens in the last uh, three or four years. Oh, I've been really the last three years I've really been gearing up towards uh, marketing local queens. But ever since I've been breeding my own queens, I've been seeing uh, a, an increase in how the bees are able to tolerate um, or just thrive more on you know like the vigor that Kirk Webster was talking about the high vigor is there so. Um, I think along overwintering, overwintering nucleus colonies and uh, breeding my own queens has definitely helped in 
keeping uh, keeping off the uh, the mycocide treadmill for me. So you're not using any pesticides. No, I have not used any pesticides in about the last two years. Okay, and Bill, I guess you wouldn't be doing any. I wouldn't, but I haven't been successful as a beekeeper, and I started off getting um, package bees. That's those are the guys that come in the mail, and the post office calls you really quickly when they arrive. Um, what I'm going to do this year is I'll be getting nukes from Kirk Webster, who was in the film, and that would be because he's done what Troy is talking about. He would sell you overwintered nukes uh, with locally adapted queens. So my idea is to start with bees that are you know, adapted to the region, and uh, he doesn't treat. And I, I think what Kurt would talk about was about 10 years ago or so, he took a lot of losses because he stopped treating, and, and then you end up uh, breeding the survivor hives and bringing in Russian queens, I think was something he did. Now he's got a really strong stock, so I think that's something that if people wanted to keep bees, they would consider you know, how you can find northern adapted party bees. And Russian queens. <laughs> um, there was a, a hand up there, yes? Uh, something that the movie touched on a little bit that I was curious about was the, um, the neonicotinoid uh, pesticides that they were saying disorients the bees and then they can't find their way back to the hive. Um, could any of you speak to any movement or legislation that might be helping to push for those pesticides being banned in a large scale? Like, is there any hope? those to be... Right, where are we on that in our country and versus the rest of the world? Anybody know? I, I don't know, but I have, I, have a, I have a thought about that, which is often people have ideas on how they should eat or how they should conduct their lives or how they should be nice to other people, and often it takes a serious illness for them to turn things around and turn from being a jerk to being a you know, compassionate person who does the things they need to do in their lives. So sometimes I think that uh, that's the hope in this situation. You can see it in New York now, they allow beekeeping in the city. Everybody in this country is aware of colony collapse disorder and how it might, might affect them. It may need to get a little bit worse, but I think that, that uh, has potential for legislation or for people changing the way they do things for the better. It might take 20 years, but that's what I see. Troy, do you know the status of it? Or Evan, you want to speak to it? I'll, I'll go real quick. Um, I do, it's, I know it's, a, I don't, I don't, I, this is my opinion, so don't quote, don't, you know, it's not, the, it's not like it could be, I, I guess, I, I do not know of any legislation being passed. I guess what I see, uh, it's a, there's a huge, you know, there's a lot of talk in the beekeeping community between, you know, you know, there, is it true or is it false or is the information, you know, is it correct between the neonicotinoids, you know, and, uh, and Bayer, the whole thing going on there. Um, I do know that, you know, at the same, the companies, the the people that are producing the, the you know, these, these genetically modified crops are also the same, you know, in the same realm, the same people that are also producing some of the miticides and some of the... Uh, they're all, I guess they're all, you know, they're all in each other's pockets, I guess. It's all about, you know, the money, and uh, it's very hard to get ahead when everything's coming from um, a, a focal point, a center point, you know, whether you're getting, you know, your mitocides or your, you know, the genetically modified crops, the seeds, and everything's all coming from, it seems like a few people, it's all coming from one location. Again, that's, I, I don't really keep track of it, uh, don't really have time to, but um, that's, that's all I know, which, could, you know, could possibly be incorrect too. So, um, let's say something quickly too about that. Um, in in France, they've successfully banned the use of uh, some of those kinds of pesticides, uh, and also in in Germany and in Slovenia. So, a couple places in Europe have successfully. Uh, Ban that, and, and it happened in France, I think, because uh, there's like a really large sunflower crop, and they were using those kinds of the neonicotinoids on the sunflowers and experiencing a lot of bee deaths because of that. And after a lot of you know, protests, like actually like in the streets, kind of that kind of vocal opposition, uh, they actually decided to to ban the use of that. So. Mm -hmm. 